I feel like it's actually quite a common thing that people body shame publicly in the name of health when actually none of the conversations are actually about your body because if someone actually cared about you and actually cared about your health, you would do it in a private setting. You're listening to the Almost 30 Podcast, a lifestyle podcast hosted by Krista Williams and Lindsay Simsek. Tune in for a new episode every Tuesday to hear our honest conversations about topics like wellness, entrepreneurship, spirituality, and self-development with guests who are really smart, really inspirational, and really fucking funny. (laughs) It's real, it's raw, and it's unfiltered. Inspired by our transition from our 20s to our 30s, we realized it's so much more than that. Our mission is to provide you with the tools, guidance, and motivation to help you navigate any transitions in your life and propel your personal growth. Thanks so much for tuning in to the Almost 30 Podcast. Here we go. I know. Yeah, we were talking about... Belly button work. Belly button work. (laughs) So at at Human Garage, where we've been going... um, they do this thing where they... So your digestion goes continuously in one way for your whole life. So the way that your everything moves is is in one direction. I don't know if it's counterclockwise or clockwise, but it's like the direction that when you go on your stomach, you rub it in that way, just like mm. naturally. But um, what they do there is they put a finger in your belly button and they <laughs> twerk it back. So they twerk it the other way. So it gives your muscles like a rest yeah. or it, it like kind of breaks up the way that everything's been going so that it can kind of be a fresh start. So you can do it by putting your finger in your belly button and just like turning it the opposite way that it would normally go. They mm-hmm. do it like very firmly. Well, there. meanwhile, there's six hands on your body. So there's one in the belly it's button. Dream. It's amazing. And I, I, he was doing something to my, I think it was my large intestines and was just kind of like moving it. Whoa. And it was like, you could actually, it went like, boom. Like it kind of like moved yeah. through whatever it was. And I was like, am I going to shit on this table? I know. Like you never know what the I body's going to do. Yeah. And then he was, I mean, it got a little intense. <laughs> it's right in that. It, like in your groin area, but like almost like on my pubic bone. So there's like a lot of tension mm-hmm. there. And I mean, I was like, I was like hopping off the table. Because it hurt. Yeah. I know. Mm-hmm. It really that, did that hurt. That part really hurts. But I just was breathing really hard. And I I literally asked him, I was like, has Krista gotten this done? Because I don't know if her pain tolerance is as good as mine. No, I haven't gotten that done. <laughs> You'd be like, nope. Nope. <laughs> I'd be like, oh, I don't know. But you know, I'd also, but I also try to do mind over matter. Same. I try really Same. hard. I'm like, this is a test. You know, whenever they're doing something like that or I'm getting a massage, I'm just like, that's really painful. I'm like, this mm. is a test. They've been releasing my jaw every time I go. Oh, they haven't released mine yet. Oh, man. Well, I have um, clicking mm-hmm. and uh, he'll go right. Jerry? Like uh, Matt. Oh. Matthew. Um, Like if you, any of you, like if you kind of go as far back as you can in your mouth, like where your molars are behind that is like just this like gummy area. Mm-hmm. And then like you feel your jaw joint and he just, I mean, it, sticks I... his thumb in there and just puts so much pressure and then asks me to bite down. So he's almost like opening as I'm biting down. It's the craziest feeling. And I was thinking, it made good? me think of like torture tactics. And I was yeah. like, oh my God, I can't believe people... Because it's not torture because I can in the moment be like, this is good for me. So this pain I'm yeah. feeling will help to you know, make my body feel better. But I'm just thinking of like pain when people are tortured. I was like, how the fuck do people live? Like, it's great. Live live through torture. I know. Because like what I'm experiencing is probably one hundredth of what they might be feeling anyway. um, But it's been really, really helpful. I've noticed my posture is certainly better. I mean, yeah. I mean, we're, you too. Yeah. We're kind of just. Yeah. I've noticed my, I'm just more symmetrical. Mm. And since they released my quads and my hamstrings last time. Yeah. Game changer. Yeah. Just weird. Like whenever you're, so whenever you're at Human Garage and you can even do this like at home, is just like to walk and notice how you walk, you know, notice how your shoulders are, how your hips are. 
how your butt is, mm-hmm. how your legs are. Like just notice like what habits you are. Are your arms freely moving back and forth, you know, with ease? There's a lot that happens that you don't think about because you're walking so much. Your shoulders and your hip joints are like mm-hmm. mirror joints. So there should kind of be like a swaggy walk, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. like your hips should sway, your shoulders should sway. Yeah. Um, and then last point about that, yesterday I was working with Daniel, I think. But anyway, he was just emphasizing because I'm on the bike a lot Mm -hmm. and won't be now like soon enough, but um, he's like, you need to get on the ground and go outside and bare feet, like walk on the beach, go Mm -hmm. on hikes barefoot. And I was like, I can hike barefoot. Oh yeah. And I was like, I'm actually excited to try it. I don't know if I'm going to be able to. (laughs) Yo, yesterday Lindsay goes, I think I want to get those barefoot shoes. (laughs) (laughs) I do. Yo, you don't want to get. I want, I want to get a cool pair. Uh, hello. You don't? No. Yo. You just want to walk around barefoot. Yeah. Look okay. At, look at the bottom of my feet. Ninety uh, 99.9%. There's a of color the of coal. They're they're coal. My feet, the bottom of my feet are coal. No, yeah. I don't mind walking around barefoot at all, but he said sometimes it gets sensitive in the beginning. So if you want a little bit of the shoe, Javiana's makes them. Uh, Hava or oh. Hav- Javianas is the flip flop brand. Barefoot shoes, dude. They make kill me though. Like as people walk around, like it's just, it's hilarious. It's very not the toe shoes, but oh, those are I was a form of toe those shoes. Oh, okay. But those are a form of them. But all the people at Human Garage wear them. Oh, really? <laughs> I mean, they're nerdy uh, as can hell. Can we make this cool? Because you could. Oh yeah, I've seen them. Liter- literally, like y- you'll see someone hot at Human Garage, and then you look down to the shoes. You're like, Jesus Christ! Yeah. <laughs> like, what's going on here? <laughs> There are some interesting barefoot but shoes. But if you think, think of... I, so he was talking about like how, you know, at one end of the spectrum, we are hunters and gatherers, you know, and we think of us as like cavemen basically. Mm-hmm. And then at the other end is someone who's like, you know, watching Netflix all day in a dark room, not going outside, on the couch, sedentary, yada, yada. And so... He was saying, he's like, you know, think about it. Hunters and gatherers had to like squat down, reach under a bush, grab the berry, pull it up, put it in the bag. Like lots Mm. of, you know, human movement Mm. all day long. Mm. And now we're just like, we're getting up, we're walking to our car, sitting in our car, getting out, walking to the office, sitting in the chair, Mm. sitting a certain way at work all day. It's the same thing every day. Mm. So our bodies are adapting really quickly in a way that's Mm -hmm. not naturally human. Mm -hmm. So it was just really interesting to think about, I don't know, just kind of like movement in nature and how like mm. it could be a little bit more fluid. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm just laughing. Because it's, yeah, that's like what they say, like CrossFit and shit. You know what I mean? No, they're, not CrossFit. Yeah, they're like functional movements. That's with weights. He's not talking about weights. Okay. He's talking about just like being in, fu- having your feet on the ground, yeah, adapting to every step. Mm-hmm. If you're on like the, in and then you step on like dirt, a needle. Literally. <laughs> if you're in dirt though, it's not consistent. If you're on yeah. sand, it's like inconsistent. So your feet have to constantly yeah. adapt. Dude, I know. I feel you that. Know? It is interesting. Like I think too, like the energy, you know, gets stuck when you're yeah. sitting all day. My dad, oh my God, when we were on flying back from Australia, my poor dad was just chilling. I'm like, hey dad, time to get up. <laughs> time to get up. Because he would just literally, he could chill there all day. Totally. Like you got to move your legs. Well, especially at your dad's age. Like, I mean, thinking about like blood clots, clots and stuff. hundred percent. Yeah. I'm like, I mean, you gotta, you gotta keep it moving. Totally. He's like, hmm. Like, <laughs> please keep it moving, dad. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> Just like, get up. Get no, some I blood know. flow. I know. Get crazy, up, bitch. Crazy. Um, What's your protocol? At For human, human garage. Yeah. Um, or are you taking any supplements or anything? Yeah. I, so like my results showed that like my kidney was kind of working over time. Um, toxicity levels were pretty high. So that could be from a lot of things. That could be from... I know, I'm so perplexed by that. Heavy I, metals. That could be from... Um, eating paint chips. Totally. It's a bad habit. Mm-hmm. I know. <laughs> Sometimes I just, I go, was I just on go that to sh- your car and I just... On that TLC show. Did you see that TLC uh-huh. show? Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh my God, I remember. remember. <laughs> I'll never forget the one episode where the girl... Lo- oh my God. I love her. The lady ate rocks. And she's like, I'm just... And literally, they're like, please stop eating rocks. Your teeth are going to fall out of your head and you're going to die. She's like, I'm just going to keep crunching. (laughs) (laughs) And I was like, yo, 
I'm going to keep crunching. Same. It's crazy. There's one girl when who like ate light love, bulbs. Like it's hard to deny someone that. Oh my God. The fucking light bulbs. She's like, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and like the filament is like stuck in her tooth. And we're like, no. <laughs> there was like a nail polish girl too. Oh. A nail polish girl. And it was like, she'd take a shot. She'd be like, all right. Red. Get out. Yeah. All right. Blue. It was like shots. Get. She would drink. Yeah, How would she not lot. die? She was going to die. Oh, okay. she, she was. That's what they were talking to her. They're like, you're going to die. I mean, can you imagine? Like, Dude, the body is crazy. The body's like, okay, this is what we're working with. <laughs> literally, <laughs> like this nutrients. Where are you at? Yeah, literally, like, All right. We'll try and see what we can pull out of this nail Holy polish. Holy shit. Wait, there was one guy on there and he didn't eat anything weird, but his car was his girlfriend. Same. And he would like lay under the car and like be like. (laughs) 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 Like make out with the car. Can you imagine like the fucking jerking off he did in that car? uh, (laughs) What did he do with that exhaust? Oh. Okay. His his peen might not be as big as the exhaust pipe. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, definitely. He's like puts cotton balls in there. Oh God. Um, So my protocol, I mean, I won't bore you with it, but this might be good for some people to know. Um, I have been um, taking... So in our water, especially in LA, we are deprived of a lot of minerals and we're not drinking the water necessarily, but yeah. a lot of the... Even the bottled water that we have doesn't have enough minerals. So I've been taking um, basically like mineral drops um, every day, three times a day. I love Just those. like sticking them in my mouth, 25 drops. Um, and then I've been taking like a d- digestive enzyme. Mm. Um, I'm trying to figure out what's been going on with my gut. My skin has been breaking out. Sakara makes a good mineral drop for yeah, water. They're and great then, too. Uh, Silver Fern brand makes a great digestive enzyme. Mm-hmm. And then I'm taking an anti inflammatory before breakfast and dinner. Oh, wow. Um, Interesting. So my inflammation was very high, uh, which I'm not. Dinner? Or just is that the time? Oh yeah, before breakfast, before dinner. Uh, anti-inflammatory and an omega supplement. So that'll help with my inflammation. Uh, I'm guessing that'll go down a bit after I stop teaching Soul Cycle. So mm-hmm. we'll see how that is. But yeah, man, I mean, inflammation to like... I actually told someone the other day that I'm O blood type and they're like, oh, you're gluten intolerant and dairy intolerant. And I knew about the dairy, but I was like... And I don't eat a lot of gluten, yeah. but for sure every once in a while I have gluten. So I I was just thinking more about that and how when I have it, then my intestines is inflamed. And then, you know, either I'm constipated, which doesn't have an, happen often, or it just goes through me really, really mm-hmm. fast. Mm-hmm. And then I'm unable to kind of take in the nutrients that would be good for me to take in. But um, so anyway. Wow. And then, yeah, I'm taking also a heptaker, which is supposed to help with my liver function and all of that. So... Yeah, it's just, it's really interesting. My pH level is high, but yours was too. We're, we're almost like uh, yeah. too alkaline. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> it is. It's like too much alkaline water. Got to chill out on that. Yeah. And then you're, you know, a lot of foods can help al- alkaline your blood mm. and clean your blood. Also was great for inflammation. Last thing is uh, curcumin. Yes. Um, so I'm taking a kind of a high intense dose of curcumin every day. Um, which is really has great. has been taking that. So my dad is almost like... That's good. Pre... Parkinson's. Mm. Um, so he gets very stiff and, you know, has problems with formation and mobility. His um, fast food diet doesn't help, mm-hmm. but he's been taking curcumin and it's helped. So good. World's helped. Wow. Yeah. It's been a, I should amazing. get my dad on that actually. You, you should. That's, you that's know, why I should get him for Christmas. Hey like, dad. Hey, that's like a tip. I mean, you know, for me and my, my parents personally, this is like my personal experience with them. I can't really get them to change their diet. I can't really get them to like change how they work out, but they will take pills. <laughs> they will. They are unafraid to take a pill or two. Mm-hmm. So I'll send my dad green tablets, chlorophyll. I'll send him curcumin. He has omegas from me. Mm. He has CoQ10. He will take as many pills as I send him. And same with my mom. They'll take all the pills, but they won't change the diet. So that has wow. helped a lot, like helped me to feel better about like, yeah. you know, what's going on. I know. I feel so helpless sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's very overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, you know, listen, I mean, everyone's on their own health journey. Uh, For me, this type of information kind of helps me 
to uh, maybe make a connection to what I've been feeling. Mm, so mm-hmm. whether it's fatigue or mm-hmm. I've been feeling inflamed or maybe my digestion's been off or maybe yeah. my skin's freaking out. So test results like these really, you know, do help. So I don't know, Re- recommend it if you're interested. I'm trying to find what the test is actually called. I know it's Bio- been- biochemical wellness analysis. BWA, yeah. Um, it was like spit and urine. Spit and pee, which... Gotta can't still can't know. pee in a cup very well. Oh really? Well, because it's like you have to stop. Obviously, yeah. I'm gonna pee more. Inevitably, it gets over, all over I my know. hand. I know. And I realize how warm my pee is. And then is it comfortable to walk outside holding your pee? The hottest guy at Human Garage that works there was just standing there as I brought out my pee. Uh, and I was like, okay, I'm sure he says this all day. All day, but still, it is like a. That's weird. Thing. And then I took forever to spit in a little tube. It's forever. It's so annoying. She's like, yeah, this will take like 20 minutes. I'm like, 20 minutes? I know. <laughs> uh, anyway. I've also too been, I have, I've been like changing my mindset with my workouts a lot. Mm. Just, you know, so I had um, surgery. I had the lipoma removed from my back, which is like a non-cancerous fatty so whatever. So I couldn't work out for like a week and a half. And then I was in Australia and didn't mm. really work out. I was in Japan. I didn't work out at all in Australia. Didn't really work out at all in Japan. And so I haven't really been working out regularly. Uh, maybe a few times a week um, when I'm here, I'll definitely be back on it. And just been feeling so much better. Isn't it nice? Well, the inflammation yeah. too. Yeah. I mean, and, wow. and I'm just like able to control my hunger a lot more. And not control in like a, the sense of control, but I'm able to I know what you mean. just listen to my body more. You know, it's much easier. And and also too, it's like a blood sugar thing. You know, like when you work out really hard, maybe doing mm, total, totally. I felt like this. There's like a blood sugar dip. So then I'd, you know, be ravenous and I'd want to just eat everything. Yeah. Um, and I'm able to, you know, like for the past couple of mornings, I... I haven't even really been hungry for breakfast. So I've been able to eat my breakfast you know, and I've been able to intermittent fast unplanned mm-hmm. and it feels really good. Yeah, I've been doing that too. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm i excited to not work out as much when I'm done with Soul Cycle. Yeah. Uh, and just kind of like listen to my body more rather than force. Obviously, I have to do it. It's my job. Mm-hmm. But I'm wondering like, it, like when that's gone, like what will my body really want to do mm-hmm. on a regular basis, yeah. you know? That's why class pass is the best. Oh my God, it's the fuck. I know. When best. I was in, I was in Australia and I was able to use class pass to go to a mega reformer Pilates there. Mm-hmm. Like whenever we travel, since we've been on tour, we always use class pass to... Dude, this next year is going to be... Oh my it's God. It's going to be so cute. They need another uh, account level. I need more. I need, I need 100. I need literally Well, you're at like credits. triple gold, p- diamond, triple gold platinum. diamond platinum. Because in New York, I was crazy. But <laughs> so when I was in Melbourne, I was able to do mega reformer Pilates. And just anywhere you go, you can check on your class pass account and you can, you know, move the city that you're at and then take classes in the city. And then there's a map that's really awesome. Mm. So we just looked at the map. What's close? What's the workout that we want to do? Here's the credits. And we don't need to deal with like seeing how much it is, seeing if there's availability, like all that kind of stuff that was like, would deter me from wanting Mm -hmm. to go to a workout on the road was like easy. Yeah. And classes just kind of take the guesswork. Like for me going to a... They actually do have gym time, Mm -hmm. which is always nice to do. But, you know, it's just like you're taking care of. Like, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? You sign up. They're expecting you. You go inevitably like meet someone or see someone you know or make friends or something like that. You're just... It's a whole like 360 experience Mm -hmm. where I'm just like, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. Don't have to think too much. Yeah. And I think we do have a code. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Yeah. So almost 30 nation, um, classpass.com slash try, T-R-Y slash almost 30 and you get a free month. Whole free month. Wow. So say it one more time because I forgot. So classpass.com slash try slash almost 30. Yep. Okay, yep. cool. And so you get you can, a free month. Yeah. Fuck so you can yeah. sign up for that free month and then, you know, give it a try. Try all the classes in your city. Go with friends. Um, it makes it really easy. And we are such fans of Class Pass. So, so worth it. For you almost 30 nation people. Class Pass. People of the nation. Slash try. Slash almost 30 for a free <laughs> month. Um, awesome. All right. So today we're really excited to welcome Michelle Elman. Ooh. She is a body confidence coach and an award-winning body positive activist. 
I was, we were, we've been kind of waiting to talk to Michelle for a long time now. We've been admiring her from afar. We've been following her hashtag, uh, scarred, not scared for a while now. I really tried to like curate my feed lately and just like take out the riffraff and really follow people that inspire me. And she is definitely at the top of the list. Yeah. And I love that her approach comes from, you know, her experiences and her truth and that you can be a board certified accredited body confidence coach, which I didn't know. Mm -hmm. Didn't know. Oh, yes. But she had, she actually had 15 surgeries in the span of 20 years. So she has scarring, you know, specifically around like her stomach and midline. And um, in 2015, she posted her first bikini picture online addressing um, the belief that people with scars can't wear bikinis. And this image went totally viral. It was on like the Today Show, Daily mm. Mail, MTV, Cosmo, BuzzFeed, all of that. And it was shared by different celebrities and things like that. But I mean, so many people have scars from surgeries, from accidents, you know, from whatever it is. And I just, she's liberating and empowering people all over the world. And it's it's really beautiful. Her voice is um, one that needs to be heard. Yeah. She also has the book, Am I Ugly? So with all the pressure that we guys, that we have, that we guys, mm -hmm. um, social media, celebrities, everything like that, it's a personal memoir that describes her childhood experiences of life-threatening health problems and times in the hospital, all the surgeries, the scars, basically how she grew to become who she is and how she grew to be the body confidence coach, have her amazing, healthy mindset around her body. So we're excited to um, have this conversation with you and hear her story and talk about some body confidence tips, tricks, how we can all really get into loving and feeling good in our body. Um, yeah. So if you love this episode or if you think it'll resonate with one of your friends or someone in your family, please share it with them. That is always, I think, one of the greatest gifts. If you read content, see content, and it makes you think of someone, it's a little gift for them. So thank you in advance for doing that. Um, and you can visit Michelle at michelleelman.com, M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E-E-L-M-A-N.com. Um, so without further ado, Body Positive Activist of the Year 2018. Woo! Michelle Elman. It's a science. I'll say it once. I'll say it again. It's a science to create a bar, a snack bar that is nourishing, healthy, not full of shit, tastes good, texture is good. I am sorry. It's just rare. But I found a bar that I really, really dig. No cow. It is a high quality non-dairy protein bar with ridiculously low sugar. I swear to God, it's the first thing I look at on the nutrition panel. Sugar, how much freaking sugar's in here and it's low on the no-cow. Um, and they also have ingredients that they truly, truly stand behind and that are like fucking powerful. So from antioxidant rich cacao to their brown rice and pea protein blend, every ingredient is carefully chosen and honestly has to pull its weight. You know, they're very proud of what goes in the bars and they are delicious. They are non-GMO, no soy, no gluten, um, made from plants. Truly love this brand. And they also just came out with their no cal energy bar. It has one gram of sugar made with a little bit of caffeine and 12 grams of protein packs a punch. We are loving this brand. So try it out. Tell us what you think. You can go to nocow.com, use our code almost 30 for 15% off and free shipping. Come on. I had this fantasy the other day that MTV Cribs was still on the air and I submitted and they came to my one bedroom apartment in West LA and I let them in and I took them directly to my fridge and I opened up the fridge. Inside was my color-coded collection of my favorite Spindrift flavors. <laughs> Anybody else? I have a new favorite healthy addiction. Spindrift is the first sparkling water made with real squeezed fruit. Yep. That's it. The fruit they use comes from family farms, so there's no added sweeteners, natural flavors, or concentrate in any of their products. So you can really trust this brand. We love them so much. Our studio is stocked. Uh, what I'm loving right now 
if you're interested, is the raspberry lime, the blackberry, the lemon, as well as the half tea, half lemon. So good. Would love to know what your favorite flavors are actually. So join our secret Facebook group. Let us know. There's nine flavors to choose from. So you can just try them all. You can find them at spindriftfresh.com. You can also find them at retailers like Trader Joe's, Whole Foods, Target and Kroger's, restaurants, cafes, Starbucks, Panera, to name a few. And also online at amazon.com. So if you are looking for a refreshing, light, bright, slightly pulpy because real fruit is in there and it's colored like real fruit because real fruit is colored. Uh, This is the beverage for you. It's delicious. And honestly, I've been mixing it with some of my favorite alcohol. So I recommend the cranberry raspberry flavor with a little bit of vodka and a slice of lime. How about it guys? All right. So you can try Spindrift for 15% off by going to Spindrift fresh.com using the code almost 30. So that's spindriftfresh.com. Use our code almost 30 for 15% off. Where in London are you? Center London. I'm Earl's Court. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's beautiful. That's yeah. Amazing. So it's like Southwest-ish. Oh, and did you grow up there? Where did you grow up? I grew up in Hong Kong and then came here at 11 for boarding school. Wow. Where'd you go to boarding school? It's just outside of London in High Wycombe. Yeah. It's what? like, you might know it because James Corden went to school. Like oh. James, he talks about it all the time. And he always just says it on his show. And I'm like, this is literally the only reason why people know what, what High Wycombe is. Because like, even when he says it on his show, it was like, no one's ever heard of it. Yeah, like no. Um, <laughs> and now everyone wants to go. But there. it's literally it's the second highest crime rate in the whole of England. So yeah, no. <laughs> no way. <laughs> Apart from Slough. Wow. Well Yeah. Yeah, I guess well, we just and by the way, we just like hop right in. Yeah, we, we just, just kind of right like because okay, cool. it's already like when we get on, I'm already like I have questions to ask. <laughs> yeah. Um and we've done an intro before and everything like that. Um okay. but it, it is so great to have you, like so good to have you on the phone. So good to see you here. I saw your TED talk um, a while ago and um, some of the girls in our community of our listeners, um, you really inspire them. So they suggested that we oh, reach out so to cool. you and do the that's interview. That's incredible. I oh, find yeah. it so strange because I always think it's just London and then it's like, of course it's not. I know. Yeah. I know. For our listeners that don't know who you are, would you introduce yourself? And I'd love to hop right into your story. Mm-hmm you know, kind of what brought you to this place of loving your body and spreading that body positivity message? Yeah, 100%. So I'm a body confidence coach and a body positive activist, and I'm the author of Am I Ugly? I um, got into all of this through my campaign that I started in 2015 called Scar Not Scared, because I've had 15 surgeries from a brain tumor, a puncture intestine, an obstructed bowel, a cyst in my brain, and I live with a condition called hydrocephalus. And those left me a lot of surgery scars um, from a really young age. So all those surgeries I had before the age of 19. And so that meant I grew up with all these insecurities about these surgery scars. And when you have insecurities around surgery scars, it's quite an unusual insecurity to have at such a young age. Um, And so when I found body positivity at 21, I was like, okay, it's great. You're all saying that all bodies are beautiful, but I'm still not seeing my body. And so I was in a really confident place in my body. I had worked really hard to overcome my own insecurities. So I was like, you know what? Why not me? Why not be the person who creates space in this community for bodies like mine? Like I'm complaining there are no bodies like mine. There will literally be a body like mine if I'm I'm a leader in this community, not someone who's sitting in the corner complaining that there isn't space for me. I love that. And for you, for growing up, having that many surgeries and having, um, you know, those sort of illnesses, what was the conversation like with your parents? And then what was it like socially, you know, as a kid to kind of explain that kind of stuff? So with my parents, I have a brother who is um, less than a year older than me. And so we were kind of treated like twins, like whatever he did, I did. He never had any health problems. So Yes, I went into hospital, but when I came out, I was treated just the same. I'd go to the same tennis lessons. I'd go to the same like horse riding classes, whatever I wanted to do. Like I was brought up with the idea that I could do whatever I want 
and my health wasn't a limitation. And in so many ways, that was such a great thing. But it also meant, it meant I never actually spoke about it. And that's how, what kind of caused the problem when it came to my friends is because I didn't know how to speak about it. I just didn't. And it was actually when I was 10 years old and I wore a bikini for the first time that provoked this conversation unknowingly where I came out at a birthday party. All my friends had started swapping from one pieces to bikinis. And I thought, like, I'll go join them. And I said to my mom, I want to get a bikini. And I remember she hesitated a little bit, but I didn't really know why. Um, And then when I came out at this birthday party and this brand new bikini that I'd bought, I had these like looks of shock and I didn't know the word for it at the time because I was so young, but pity. And I couldn't explain it and I couldn't Mm. understand it because I'd never actually told my friends that I'd had surgeries. Mm. And so it was this weird thing of, especially around my friends, when I went into like adolescence, it was just, the solution was to not talk about it. And that's kind of how I dealt with it was um, anytime I talk about it, I'm separated from my friends. I'm pulled away from my life. Anytime I talk about my health, like I'm sent home because I've got a headache and I hated that. I just wanted to be normal. And so I just thought the solution was don't talk about it. You will be normal. And so I kept it almost a secret. A few of my friends knew I had surgery because I went into hospital first year of primary and secondary school. So it was kind of like always known. And um, I never really had the kind of conversations I have today, but also I never really had a conversation with most of my friends. So what was it like having all of those surgeries and pretty close together? Like as a child, was it just, was it your normal or what did that feel like? And how did you like get through that? There is a point where you don't realize you're different. So until that moment when I was 10 years old, I didn't see a difference. I could see my brother's stomach. I could see my stomach and I didn't see a difference. I knew I went into hospital and my friends and my brother didn't. But it wasn't like this conscious thing in your head that you were different until I guess those looks that I received kind of tainted the image I had about like illness and my scars. And I kind of learned from that moment that it was a bad thing. Also, when you go through it at such a young age, you aren't ready to talk about it because you don't know how to talk about it. You're going through experiences that almost aren't age appropriate, even though you're going Mm. through it at that age. And so Mm -hmm. how do you talk to a child about it? I'm guessing my parents must have asked me if I was okay, but like I didn't, I couldn't even put words to the things I was feeling and I couldn't for many years. What actually started my book was a school project at 12 years old when in English class we were asked to write an autobiography and I start writing this autobiography and I literally couldn't put words to how I was feeling at the time. So I remember writing the whole book and having to go backwards and being like, okay, that time I died, how should I have felt that time? And so I literally inserted sentences, uh, which was like, I am sad, I am angry, (laughs) because it's just like, I knew how I should feel, but I couldn't feel anything in regard to any of it. Mm. Can you talk about dying? Yeah, it's actually something I never talked about for a really long time because Mm. I thought people thought I was crazy because I did what happened to me was the actual like floating above your body. And I remember everything that happened in the room. But then when I came back into my body, all the nurses and doctors said that my eyes were closed. So mm-hmm. they weren't sure how I'd seen anything. Um, and I saw a bright white light and all of those things. But actually how I started talking about it was when I, I think I was about 20 when my friends lost her grandmother. And I said to her like, oh, well, I've not really spoken about this, but I've actually died and I still remember the feeling and if it gives you any solace it's actually the calmest I've ever felt so it's quite a nice thing to know that everyone leaves the earth and like moments before I was in absolute agony but it literally just disappeared Um, and I actually felt a lot of guilt afterwards because um, I saw I when I was floating above my body I could see my parents crying And so I went back into my body. I was like, wait, so I saw my parents crying and I felt nothing. And because I was 11 years old and I didn't know how to understand that, I just felt really guilty that I could see my parents cry and not feel a single thing. But actually, I I don't know whether it's the ending of like nerve endings disappearing or whatever it is. But um, it is a very unusual experience that it's strange. I've only spoken to one person who's had the same feeling. And she said, I felt exactly the same. And I had the floating above my body thing. 
Um, but it is strange, but it's also quite a comfort to know that no matter how much pain you are in moments before, it does all disappear, like right as you're about to go and you do feel ready. Mm. How did like your parents deal with, you know, being in and out of hospitals? I can imagine that they're just in this constant state of fear that the next surgery could be one that, you know, could be, you know, something that could either severely affect you for the rest of your life or even take your life. So like, how did, were they overprotective? Like, were they overbearing? Like, how did that shift kind of your relationship with them? I think because, well, so my dad has actually uh, previously lost a child and when he was uh, five years old. And so, and that was my dad's first child when he was about 25 and he had me when he was 50. So I'm his last child. Um, and, uh, it, it was quite strange because it was something that I, to this day, I don't know how I knew that information because I've never spoken about it to my dad. I just, I somehow in my childhood found out that my dad had lost a child. And from that moment, I was quite, from my side, I was like, I can't cause more pain than has already been caused kind of thing. The only time it really comes up with my parents is if I mention I have a headache. Even to this day, if I casually mention I have a headache, they'll be like, you need to go to the doctor. Blah, blah. And I'm like, look, I can get a headache and be fine. Mm-hmm. Not everything is a like, life-saving surgery. Right. Um, but that, that is the one thing. So I quickly learned as like a teenager to just not mention it if you have a headache. If the headache continues for like a week or like even a month, I push it quite a lot. So I like even as a teenager, even when I went into hospital when I was 19, I will pretend everything is fine until like the last moment because in my head, I'm still trying to make, like I'm still trying to feel like I'm okay, if that makes sense. Like I'm the person who's like, I don't want to go back into hospital more than my parents. And I think even if they were feeling all those things, and I'm sure they were, they did their best to try to keep it away from me. But even as a child, you kind of know that there is like a lot of stress in the room. There's a lot of fear in the room. It's just no one's talking about it. Mm. And you could feel that. You can kind of like pick up on that as a kid. It's so interesting that, you know, it kind of seems like when you, the bikini moment, when you kind of go out there and you don't think anything different about your body and then you see the reactions and you kind of realize or you like understand what's happening it seems like that was like a turning point for you. And then I can imagine from that point on is kind of moving into seventh grade or for us, it's seventh and eighth yeah. grade. Um, for you guys, it's different. But, and then from there, it's all the, com- there's a lot of comparison. So you're kind of like yeah. checking in on your friends and seeing what's going on. And then, you know, you're at boarding school. So what was, was that just like agony and misery of, of being in your body and of having situations where you're around people that are also kind of hating their body? Well, so it was quite strange. So for us, it was the second, the penultimate year of primary school. And then I had one more year of primary school. And then I went into secondary school where obviously it was a boarding school and you were changing in dorms with a lot of people. So I shared a room with like eight girls. Then you're changing and changing rooms with 30 girls. And it's strange how it never became a conversation. Mm. Like... I don't know where the girls felt awkward around it, but I guess people knew early on that I'd had surgeries because I went into hospital first year of boarding school as well. And it was just never a conversation. It would only really be when younger girls came into the changing room who didn't know and they would stare. And um, there was one memory I have where this younger girl was just staring at my stomach for so long that I just turned her and I was like, do you want to take a picture? And like (laughs) all my friends found it really funny. But that was kind of my only way of dealing with it because I just, I had, I hadn't been used to people staring and it'd been such a non-conversation for so long that when things like that did happen, it was the rare occasion. Mm. At what point I'm trying to kind of track like when social media came into the picture. Mm. So social media came, so Facebook was when I was 15 and then Mm. Instagram was my second year of uni. So it was quite late. Facebook didn't really... We were so limited on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Do you remember the early days of Facebook? There really wasn't much there anyway. Yeah. Um, and only only really at the beginning of my uni stage was 
was it a, like pictures on Facebook started happening and you didn't want to be tagged in an unflattering photo kind of thing. So thankfully, I, I just, I feel bad for generations these days because I wouldn't have wanted Instagram any younger than I did have it. Like getting mm. it at 19 was really fun because it was like uni days and like you have all those pictures from that moment, those moments. But yeah, social media didn't really impact my body confidence journey. It was just more the fact that well, if I had it younger, I think I would have known there were other people with surgery scars. I literally lived my life thinking I was the only person with surgery scars because I'd never seen anybody in either a magazine or in real life with a scar. It was actually when I was 21 was the first time I saw someone with a scar by a beach. Really? What did yeah. that feel like? Well, so it was actually strange because it was the day before. So I, at that point, I was um, a trained life coach and I was going to special, I was choosing a specialty because I was being told by my mentors, no one's a life coach, you have to choose a specialty in life coaching. And so I was like, okay, I really want to do confidence. And I had gone to Australia with a friend and I was like, I really want to do confidence, but I actually only really care about body confidence. And I think I want to specialize in just body confidence. Um, and then she turned to me and she was like, how are you going to help people with body confidence if you don't even wear a bikini? Because I was wearing a tankini by the beach in Australia. And I was like, well, it's not about the bikini. So like, I'll be fine. But also people with scars can't wear bikinis. And literally the next day we're by the pool and there was a girl on the other end of the pool and she came running back from the other end of the pool being like, Chelsea, you have to go to the other end of the pool. I was like, what, why? She was like, there's a girl, sit, uh, girl lying down over there with a scar. So I walked to the other end of the pool expecting scars like mine. Um, and for people who've not seen my stomach, they're across my entire stomach. They're kind of like an incomplete game of noughts and crosses or like a <laughs> smiley face is how my followers refer to it. Um, and there's this girl with the tiniest appendicitis scar. But it was just, it was enough for me to be like, you know what? I've said my whole life people with scars can't wear bikinis. And then there's a girl literally proving me wrong. And I can keep moving the benchmark because that's what we do. We're like, oh, well, her scars are not as big as mine. So I still can't wear a bikini. But I was like, you know what? I'm like done with the excuses. And that's when I decided, it was literally that day that I decided to start my campaign. Um, and I decided, so that was January. And I decided that that summer was going to be the summer I wore a bikini for the first time. And I was going to Florida in the summer and I knew that already. And I was like, in Florida, I'm going to wear a bikini for the first time. And that was the picture that launched Scar Not Scared. I'm in a serious relationship with my liver. After I read how important the liver is in all of its functions and mysteries and how I can be just serving it better while still living my life, I'm obsessed. And one of the ways in which I take care of my liver is I take what I think is the liver superhero drink, uh, morning recovery. So while I don't drink too much. When I do drink, I know it is really important for my body that it's able to cleanse the toxins ASAP. So this drink um, boosts my liver's natural ability to break down the alcohol. Um, so last week, I knew I was going to be enjoying some wine with friends out at dinner, just typical protocol where we were going. So I actually brought morning recovery in my purse. It fit in my little bag. And so right after after dinner, I took it, woke up, felt like a million bucks, could do a workout early. It was awesome. Normally I don't feel like that. So it works. I've tried it. Would love for you to try it. Let us know. It's incredible. You can find them on at Morning Recovery on Instagram. You can order on morningrecoverydrink.com. Use our code ALMOST30 for $5 off either a single purchase or a subscription. So morningrecoverydrink.com. Use our code ALMOST30 for $5 off a single purchase or subscription. Well, I was caught. I was eating some skinny dipped almonds right out of the bag, uh, put them away. And I, I suppose I scratched my nose, went out on some errands. I had some cacao dust on my nose. Nobody told me, <laughs> um, but proudly, I really don't care. Um, skinny dipped hands down. My favorite snack. It is so delicious, satisfying. What I love is I can have them before a workout. I'm not too like shaken by any sugar high, anything like that, or I can have it as, as dessert. 
easily, which I do most often. And I'm loving uh, right now the raspberry. So it's dusted with a little raspberry flavor, um, but they have it down to this perfect science, the ratio of this like crunchy coating and dusted with chocolate. I, I can't even describe it. You got to taste it. They have a lot of fiber, tons of protein. This snack is for everyone. Great for your family. And this company is founded by friends and family who love each other so much. They put pour so much love into these products. You can taste it. Uh, we have an interview with the founders coming out soon. So stay tuned for that. But Skinny Dipped is the shit. SkinnyDip.com. You can use our code ALMOST30 for 20% off your first order of these delightful almonds. Trust me when I say you're going to stock up in every nook and cranny of your life. So skinnydip.com almost 30 is the code for 20% off your first order. When you're with friends and you kind of have this awareness and they have this awareness, it's like, how much do you bring up the fact that what you're dealing with. Maybe it is like super prevalent one day and not the other, but I know you mentioned um, in our research, you've mentioned kind of like attracting more of those comments or thoughts or attention. And it's like, what is this feeling of the energy that you're putting out into the world, which is so positive, but it's also like you are a human being and just like everyone else. So it's like, how much do, do you, you know, separate yourself to give your message, but then also like emphasize that you are just like any other human. Does that make sense? I'm sorry. That was yeah. a little... <laughs> no, hundred percent. And the way I've learned to do it, and it's been a like learning process along the way, because I've now been running it for, I've been an online presence, if you want to call that. Uh, <laughs> I'd never know what to call myself an influencer or whatever it is for four years. And it's been a learning curve with that. But now what I've learned is how... I, I use a phrase, which is I share my scars, not my wounds. So if I'm currently processing something and it still hurts, I don't talk about it on the internet because I believe you're then talking about it for external validation and you're healing it from a different perspective. So like, for example, uh, last year I went through a lot of boy troubles and I didn't speak about it once. And at the beginning of this year, I was like, hey, I saw it, I'm cool. I'm now going to start talking about it, but I'm not going to talk about it whilst not only I don't have the answers, but also I'm hurting and I can go on the internet and project that everywhere, but that's not helping anyone. That's not it helpful insight. It's also not helping me. And I feel like there's too much of that on the internet already where we're just... I think that's where you get to the point of oversharing. And so that's where I've learned where my line is, is that if I'm currently processing processing something as much as I want to. And there are t days where I really want to go on the internet and just like spiel everything. I'm like, no, you process it yourself and then you talk about it. You don't do it at the same time. Mm, that's a really good point. Yeah. I'm into that because some people use it as a way to process in the feedback. Yeah. So for, um, so you went through, you know, your life, all the surgeries and then the death and kind of having this war with your body because it was, um, it just didn't probably feel like a home when you're having all these surgeries and everything like that. You have these scars. So what was the turning point where you were like, I actually am going to love my body? Like, what was that decision like? And how did you sort of continue to make that decision every day? Because I know it's not just like making one decision. Yeah. So actually, um, I got okay with my weight before I got okay with my scars. So I started gaining a lot of weight post-surgery. Every time I go into hospital, I am prevented from eating and then my body goes into starvation mode. And I gained a lot of weight after coming out of surgery when I was 11. And it also coincided with the time all my friends had started dieting. So it was mm. like all my friends were losing weight and I was eating my apps, like the same diet that I'd always eaten before and just gaining uncontrollably. Now I understand it. Now I know why. Um, but at the time, I had to get okay with my weight because my scars I could hide and it did seem like as big of a problem. Um, and it was actually a day I was walking after the sports class and my I had a friend who I thought was the most gorgeous person in the world. And if I had her body, 
all my problems would disappear and I'd have the perfect life. And I was walking with her and I walked past this door and she looked at herself in the reflection and she went, damn, I'm ugly. And it was that moment that not only because I envied her and I was jealous of her body, but it was also something about the fact that it wasn't even a mirror, it was a door. And that like the door doesn't even serve a purpose of giving you your reflection. You're literally just meant to walk through it. But even in that moment, she couldn't stop obsessing over her reflection. And then she said something about her thighs, about how big her thighs were. And for the first time in my life, I looked down at her thighs. And if you think about like everything I've said so far about how I was just trying to take as much of a focus off my body as possible, I was like, wait, every time I complain about a body part, people look at it because that's what humans do. In, like Intrinsically, your attention is drawn to it. And so I was like, I'm just going to stop talking negatively about my body. And that kind of spirals into, I'm going to stop talking negatively about myself because it's just pointing out everything I want people to not notice. Um, But over time, by not talking negatively about my body and not talking negatively about myself, people actually started assuming I was confident because I wasn't joining in on those conversations. And slowly that built my confidence. And then when I was 18 and starting to think about dating and going to university, that's when I had to sort of deal with the scars side of it. That was probably a two-step process. There was, I talk about this in my book, where the night where I lose my virginity is actually the night where all my friends, all my uni friends find out about my scar. And it's because we're playing a game of truth or dare. And (laughs) <laughs> it's it's a funny story, but it's also like a stereotypical UV story where I take my top <laughs> off as a dare and like I'm still wearing a bra and everything, but I just was, I had completely forgotten about my scars, take my top off. It's the fourth day of the university and the friend who asked me to do it was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry to put your top back on. I'm so sorry to out you like that. And I was like, oh no, sorry, I just have some surgeries. And it was the most clumsy way of explaining it that I explained it. And I had spent so long worrying about university and how I was going to explain it. And then it just happened on the fourth day. Um, And at the end of that evening, one of the guys who was in the room at the time started flirting with me. And in my head, I was like, how are you flirting with me? You see my scars. Like any guy who's ever flirted with me before hasn't seen my scars, but you see my scars. And that was kind of a shift in it. But even despite that, over the next couple of months, I was still really insecure about my scars, especially when it came to relationships, especially when it came to being in the bedroom. And it was one night I was walking with a guy friend and he had walked in on me having a girly conversation like two weeks before with all my girlfriends being like, I had compared my body to a damaged handbag. And I said, if like, if, uh, if you, you wouldn't go to a store and pick up the handbag with all the scratches all over it. So why would you like want a body like mine? Um, and he walked in on that conversation. And when he walked in, we could kind of ended it. But a few days later, he was like, you know, when I walked in on that conversation where you're t- comparing yourself to a damaged handbag, you weren't talking about your body, were you? And I was like, yeah, I was. Why? And he was like, because he, he said something like, your, your scars act like a filter for all the, I don't know whether I could swear, but <laughs> yeah, all can. the all the assholes in the world and Mm. you're just really lucky because you get that filtering system. Whereas most girls have to find out three months down the line and have their heart broken along the way. Uh, mm. And something flipped in me that evening because this was the like most confident guy. He was like captain of the football team. He would, in the middle of dinner, most nights, he would jump on the table and start singing Wonderwall. Like he was so (laughs) confident. And (laughs) I was like, how are you giving me, like how, how, because he had, he'd gone on this rant about how he had, um, psoriasis and he had an afro and he was ginger and he was like I have all like oh, mm. all the reasons in the world to be insecure and like I'm not so you can you can like shove all of your excuses in the bin and it was kind of that moment where I was like if he can be that confident and he's like got all these stereotypical flaws that society wants to like deem as imperfections then he's right like if I I can't, I can't date someone who's not okay with my scars because they're not going to be the kind of person who would be there for the surgeries. Like, if you can't handle the scars, how are you going to handle the surgeries? And so it's kind of this moment where I was like, all of these things that I'm worried about and all these things I've made such a big deal about 
shouldn't be a big deal if you're with the right person. And that from like all of those moments kind of add up, added up. And from that moment forward, I was kind of like, I'm just, I'm bored of worrying about it. Like I'm done. And I can't, I can't keep having these same conversations where I'm putting myself down the whole time. Mm. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> it's so crazy. So like it's just so, it's so important. You know, people are not you, no one is you, but the littlest thing that your friend said that he probably doesn't remember changed yeah. the course of your life. You know, even on the the negative, you know, the the mothers at the pool or the kids at the pool looking at you in that way changed the course of your life. So yeah. it's like just such a reminder that, you know, little things that you could say, little words of encouragement and being aware and being conscious are just so impactful. I mean, I can think of little things that people have said to me in my life throughout high school and college that completely changed the course of my life and are things I think about today. So there are opportunities and there are those moments where you can do that for someone and you can be that for someone. And even if you aren't confident in yourself, you know, your friend, even if he wasn't confident, you could still be confident for someone else and yeah. see, you know, the beauty in other people. But yeah, I think that's that's beautiful. But it's also why when I start, started my campaign, I was really focused on the fact that people with the scars aren't the one with the problem. It's actually how other people react to it. Because every single person I'd spoken to with a scar has a story that I have, like a similar story about when people stared at me in, in a bikini. They have stories like that. And that's what causes the insecurity. But before that point, it's just a scar it's not given a negative connotation. And so for this conversation to actually have any impact, it needed to not just include the people with the scar, but everyone else as well. Um, and over the last four years, I believe it has changed. Like when I first started posting pictures of other people's scars, it would always be like, the responses were always like, ew, or why do you have to post that? It's so graphic. Even a completely healed scar. And now I get, I never get that on my page. Like not once. Because you've kind of set the standard. And I think like... I think it's normalized now. Yeah. Like I, even, even there are people in um, adverts with scars now. Like it's part of mm -hmm. a normal human bo body. There are 85 million people with a scar. Mm. Yeah. Um, at what point did becoming a coach mm -hmm. kind of dawn on you? Or like when did that... Be some, uh, become something that you could really embody and feel comfortable doing? So I wanted to be a psychologist when I was 11. Like when I was lying in hospital, um, I met a psychologist, a child psychologist actually. And I said to her, I really want to help people with their scars. Like I want to specifically work in hospitals mm. and help people who have either been diagnosed with diabetes or have like just be, been in um, a fire and like help them with their burns and like emotion the emotional side of all of these life changes and so I was kind of working towards that I did the psychology a level I did psychology degree at university and then in my third year of university um I'm sitting in one of my final psychology lectures and I just got massively triggered and all of the memories that I'd kind of repressed over the last 10 years just like flashed before my eyes and I just had a period of like three months where I couldn't stop crying. And I just had, I had my dissertation to finish and I just couldn't even like see the road ahead because I was just like overwhelmed by all the memories of the past. And I eventually went to therapy and got help and got diagnosed with PTSD, um, which was really strange for me because I wouldn't have even classed as what I went through as a trauma. And so I was like, well, it's not a big deal. It's all in the past. It was 10 years ago. Why am I worrying about it now? Um, and I was in therapy for about four months, but I found we were just going round and round in circles for quite a while and it wasn't helping me. It like the initial cathartic nature of just like talking really helped, but that was only like, that was quite limited. Um, so I was like, I can't be a psychologist if I don't believe in it. And so I started looking for other models and that's how I found life coaching. Now I know the difference. And now I know that like, Actually, when it comes to PTSD specifically, it's been shown that talking therapy isn't helpful compared to things like the things that I use are havening and neurolinguistic programming and things like that. But it's also about finding the right therapy at the right time. And 
doesn't mean any therapy is wrong because it's not. But at the time, because I was so in my PTSD headspace, I just felt like there were just like roadblocks in front of me. And so I crossed off the option of being a psychologist, but then fell in love with coaching because it like, I walked into a session of pavening, have feeling every single symptom in the world and walked out and never felt a symptom since. And it's been four years just from like hysterical crying to not, to actually being able to think and like be happy again. And it was just this relief. And I walked out of that session. And I was like, whatever he's trained in, I want, like, I want to learn how to do that. I want to work in a model of therapy that like I believe in. I've since gone back into talking therapy and I believe in its strengths as well, but it's different strengths for different things. But that's kind of how I got into all of it. And I think the best thing about the coaching stuff and also talking therapy is that when it all works together and to have a therapist who is knowledgeable about all models and all areas. But that's kind of how I got into all of it was through personal experience. And now I wouldn't ever go to a therapist who doesn't go to therapy themselves. Hmm. That's interesting. What I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with havening. What is that? What it's quite a new age thing. So cool. it basically it basically is all about the neurotransmitters and it's the idea that with trauma, um, for a trauma to exist, you actually can't escape. So that's how trauma is created. It's like, because I was trapped in a hospital bed or like what's more most stereotypical, like most people when you mention PTSD, they tend to know it as like rape victims or war, war veterans. They can't escape as well and that's how trauma is created. So what havening does is they believe that it's neurobiologically actually in our system. This trauma is like trapped and that you need to relive it in a safe environment. So your body knows that it's safe. So it is all, it's like a psychosensory therapy and it's about rewiring your neural pathways. And it focuses Mm. more on that than trying to understand your trauma because most people do understand their trauma and it's not the understanding of it doesn't relieve the symptoms. It's actually just the fact that it's a feedback loop that um, that has is being triggered at the wrong times because your body thinks it's in danger. Mm. And so what would that experience be like then with havening? Would you be in the room and then you have wires that are kind of tracking your brain, what's being lit up? Or are you like, what is that like then? No, it's really strange. There were no wires, there were no anything. And it's based on the idea that if you just mention a memory, it's already running inside your body. So all I said, all the therapist knew about me was he said, what's the most worst memory you have from your time in hospital? And I said, the moment I died. And he was like, cool, that's enough. It's already running in your pathway because for you to imagine it, all the chemicals that were released in that moment are already running in your body. And then what they do is they they create delta waves. And how you do that is by moving your eye patterns in opposite directions. And then um, you do a soothing, I can't do it because I'm holding the phone, but like (laughs) you do it in like a soothing pattern. So like things which are quite intrinsic in like how you're um, cared for as a baby. So like rubbing your, from your shoulders to your elbows going like that or running the, rubbing the temples of your head or stroking your cheeks things like that, which like helps your body to unlearn that pattern and helps your body to realize it's in a safe environment. And then you disrupt, you basically disrupt the pattern. So you can't, it can't run. So like it ends up looking quite weird to an onlooker because you end up like singing happy birthday halfway through. And it's basically preventing the automatic mechanism from running because it's like, it's, you you recall the memory, you feel the feelings, and then it, like a whole set of symptoms start. And it's basically interrupting each of them by either rubbing your arms or seeing half birthday or moving your eyes from left to right. And it's disrupting all of it. And your body gets basically quite confused being like, what's going on? Because mm. I should be, I should be running a trauma response. And, but by interrupting it and uh, interrupting it a number of times, it can't complete that pattern. And so what I, what had been happening for me for the last three months is I would mention one of these memories and I would just hysterically start crying. What havening did for me was it prevented all of the physical symptoms from happening. So I could actually get to the process of dealing with the emotional side of it. Mm, cool. 
What was that? What's the neuro linguistic programming? So that is the model of the, the mod, well, it's like, it's more like coaching. So neuro linguistic programming is uh, <laughs> the hardest thing to explain in the world. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically a, a model of thinking which puts more of the focus on the future than the past. So that's the difference between coaching and therapy, where um, a therapist will un- help you understand why something happened. Whereas a coach will work towards what you want more of in the future. So that's Mm -hmm. kind of the difference. Is the havening kind of like a hypnosis? Like, and if not, okay. okay. And Mm -hmm. same with NLP. So a neuro-linguistic program is also a form of hypnosis. Because I also use hypnotherapy, but the thing with hypnosis is that any type of hypnosis, even recalling the memory of hypnosis, is said to be hypnosis as well. So the term is used quite loosely. <laughs> mm. How has your relationship since becoming a coach, since um, having these tools, how, was, how have your relationships changed? Friends, dating, family? I feel like the, the coach thing impacts relationships if you don't know how to boundary your coaching ability because the worst thing in the world is being a friend who like you just want to talk to your friend about something and they're like trying to coach you. So (laughs) in the first six months, I had to like be really conscious of being like, do you want advice or do you want me to just listen? Because that can really affect relationships. But to be honest, the it's more the body positivity side that has affected relationships. When you're as vocal as I am about body positivity, and when you live in a world that's so filled with like diet culture and everything that goes against body positivity, that seems to impact relationships a lot more. Um, and I've been friends with people for like years and then suddenly one day they turn around to me being like, I think what you do is disgusting and that you're making everyone gain weight and that you're not happy in yourself. And I'm like, oh, cool. Thanks for your opinion. No Can you just way. kept that quiet for the last three years? What do you say to that? I cut those people out of my life because I've not, I've not changed. Well, I have changed. I've changed in many ways, but also, so what happened with that friend was she was actually there with me the day I um, wore a bikini for the first time. So I was a bit like, it's a bit strange that ever since the day you knew me, I've been on this body positive journey. And I think it's more a reflection of... 100%. This is going to sound really arrogant, but my success, because it only seemed to become a problem once I was doing well and in a like stable place in my career. And I think it just brings out other people's insecurities. And I hate saying that because it sounds so arrogant, but it is what the reality of what my life has been like for the last two years, I would say. And for me, I just don't go down the route of justifying my body. And if you want to sit there and I mean, the main thing she said was that I was in denial and that my my job was a fraud and I was in denial about my weight and that um, I was going to wake up one day and realize how truly unhappy I was. I was like, I've never been happier right now. So I'm not sure what you're talking about. When Um, people project their own unhappiness mm -hmm. onto you and it makes no sense. Mm -hmm. It's just really interesting. It comes out of nowhere. Like it was... It was also done in a public setting in oh, front God. of a lot of people. And it was done in a way where she said, oh, I care so much about your fertility and your blood sugar. I've never had a problem with my fertility and I've never had a problem with my blood sugar. <laughs> but it's, I feel like it's actually quite a common thing that people body shame publicly in the name of health when actually none of the mm. conversations are actually about your body. Because if someone actually cared about you and actually cared about your health, you would do it in a private setting. Yeah. And also, if you actually care about someone's health, then why are you body shaming them? Because body shaming anyone doesn't lead to better health, doesn't lead to someone losing That's weight. True. It leads to a more unstable mental health. It leads to people feeling more isolated. And it feels leads to... like I, I've still not, I still can't understand this mentality of how shaming other people is meant to be better for anyone. Because... Shaming has never been proved to be um, to lead to long-term weight loss, first of all. Second of all, weight discrimination has shown to have a worse effect on your health than existing at a higher weight. So there's a lot of research and a lot of science out there, but it's just what I believe it is, is a quick, easy dig at someone 
And it's when you want to hurt someone, that's an easy thing to say. Yo, alert the media because my shower experience just got insane. Kapari is doing it right. Kaparibeauty.com. I'm using the coconut shower oil and I'm a new woman. Post shower hydration is insanely good. It gently cleanses all of my body parts below the neck, of course, because they have a coconut cleansing gel for face as well. Um, But it doesn't strip my skin. Sometimes when I wash my body with shower gel, I feel like dry afterwards. So it's a unique blend of cleansing oils, attracts impurities, and then you could just like froth it all away. It's sweet. It's just, it's just my favorite. Um, they also have my favorite deodorant. I mean, I'll tell you till I'm blue in the face. It's the best, the coconut deodorant. Um, you don't have to worry about aluminum, phthalates, any crap. It's so, so good. And great stocking stuffer or gift this season. So check it out. Um, Kopari is a company that uses uh, ethically sourced coconuts. They care about their products, what goes in their products, and they care about their customers and their products reflect that. We love them so much. Koparibeauty.com, K-O-P-A-R-I beauty.com. Use our code almost30 for 15% off your first order. Have at it. So sometimes we get questions about why we offer different types of the same product. Okay, let me explain. So when it comes to feminine care, for example, we have talked about menstrual discs, menstrual cups, organic tampons, and people are like, wait, so what do you what do you promote then? Well, we promote feminine care that is safe to use for all women. And by giving you the options, you can find one that works for you because no two bodies are the same. No two people are the same. So we want to make sure it is our responsibility to vet these products and then give you options. So today I want to talk about Lola. I mean, Lola is our tried and true uh, tampon choice. It is female founded. They care so much about their products. They are 100% natural. No BS, no mystery fibers, nothing like that. They have panty liners, tampons. They actually do have um, the uh, feminine wipes as well, which I love. If you don't use feminine wipes, you should. What's really interesting though, and Lola kind of taught me this, FDA, the FDA doesn't require brands to disclose a comprehensive list of ingredients in their feminine care products. So most of them don't. Um, But Lola, mm -hmm, they're transparent. They're like, what? Look at it. They're all natural. They're good for you. Don't worry, which is awesome. I trust them so much. You have to be careful. Some tampons have bleach in them and then you put it in your vagina. That is not good. Okay, so for our listeners, and it's really great, you can go to lola.com and you can customize your order, which is great. On a subscription basis, you can use the code almost30 for 40% off all subscriptions. My Lola, M Y L O L A dot com, and use the code almost30, A L M O S T 3 zero when you subscribe and you'll get 40% off. Hell yeah. The whole relationship with shame, you know, I think it, for women, especially it extends beyond just, um, the body, you know, when women either take care of themselves in a certain way, or I think I read a post on your Instagram, you know, if someone wants to rest or like find quiet time, like don't shame them for resting and taking time for themselves to do basically nothing. So what are other forms of shame that you've kind of wanted, seen and wanted to liberate? I think um, there's a lot of shame around a woman being angry. I think it starts with the angry feminist stereotype and that no one wants to be an angry feminist. But actually, women have a lot to be angry about. And when we live in a society where women are the oppressed gender, then like, why, why don't we have a right to be angry? But on like a broader level, why, what is so wrong with a woman experiencing anger? Because when a man experiences it, they're seen as powerful. But when a woman is, she's deranged or she's whatever, hysterical, mm. which is just a sexist word in itself. I wish we got to a point in a society, and I hope we are, where women is entitled to all emotions 
without being stigmatized for it. Like a lot of people like to say that, oh, men aren't allowed to cry, um, but women are allowed to feel their emotions. Actually, very rarely do people let women feel their emotions and not they don't uh, have a consequence for it. Because even when a woman is allowed to cry, they're still being judged. When a woman is being angry, there are still consequences to her being angry. Whereas like with men, yes, they're not allowed to cry, but at least like when they are, it's seen as like, oh my God, that's like, at least he's in touch with his emotions. It's always seen as a positive thing. So that's one thing. I also think the thing that you said with um, not being allowed to rest is a huge thing because women are told that they need to be selfless and they're not a worthy human being unless they're they're literally the bottom of their own to-do list and like everyone else comes before them and that we need to stop that like tying our value to our productiveness because so what you lie on the couch for one day like you're allowed to rest you're gonna have a breakdown if you don't stop and this go 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 mentality works for some people but for other people they need more rest for other people they need time off they need to sleep more and that's okay you shouldn't feel guilty for that Mm. amen preach i love that i love that about the angry woman i haven't thought about that in that way and i think that's really beautiful i love that I wanted to... So for our listeners and for our community, we actually, in our secret Facebook group, had a thread a few days ago about how we're all feeling about our bodies, our relationship with our bodies and confidence there. Um, you know, There's some great things and some hard things to read, uh, especially for some amazing women. So what are some tips that you give to some of your clients or what are some things that we can have our listeners... Um, do today or this week that will help them feel better in their bodies? So the first homework, I guess, I give my clients is to brush your teeth naked. So I don't believe you can love your body if you don't know what your body looks like. (laughs) Um, Brushing your teeth, we do it anyway. It's two minutes. Um, It's a manageable focused task. So if you... Because the worst thing when you stare in a mirror and you're um, insecure is your inner critic will start going wild. So when you're brushing your teeth, you can at least focus on that task. So as soon as a negative thought comes into your head, go back to focusing on the teeth brushing. Um, And once you get used to your appearance and used to seeing your body naked, that's when you can start like actually looking in the mirror a bit more and focusing on your inner critic. What What are you actually saying to yourself? What thoughts are true? Why does it matter whether it's true or not? What's convenient? Is it more convenient to believe you're beautiful or is it more convenient to believe you're ugly? Um, I teach my clients a lot that I just don't believe in true or false because like, who can prove that I'm beautiful? Who can also prove that I'm ugly? You can't. It's a subjective thing. So what's convenient? It's convenient for me to believe I'm beautiful. It's really inconvenient for me to believe I'm ugly. Um, So we start working with thoughts I've been spending a lot of time on Twitter at the moment. And one of the main (laughs) things I'm realizing is we all hate being judged, but we all judge each other way too much. And so one of the things that I'm start like I've been talking about quite a lot recently is also to work on your judgmental attitude. If you start working on how judgmental you are, you will stop feeling judged. And it's not that you aren't being judged, it's that your focus isn't on it anymore. But whilst you're judging everyone else in the world, no wonder you think you're being judged and no wonder you think everyone's staring at you because you are probably doing the same to other people. My gosh, I have that like situation in my my some of my close relationships. Mm. Like I've had a situation where they'll be like, I think you're judging me or I feel judged. And it's literally like because they're the biggest judgers. Yeah. And they live their life being fearful of what everyone else thinks or feeling like all eyes are on them. It's almost narcissistic in a way. And so they think that they're being judged. But there's mm. also something too I've been thinking about um, you know, when I'm with friends or in situations with different groups of people, oftentimes I'll like leave that situation and either I'm with Lindsay or I'll be with Justin and I'll talk about the people there. Um, I'm, you know, we're never bashing anyone. We're never saying anything negative, but it's even just like a conversation. And I've been kind of thinking about, you know, on the flip side of them leaving their situation where they were probably interacting with me and them talking about me with whoever they're talking about. And it's kind of a weird feeling And I've been thinking about, I kind of want to, not that, again, we're not talking bad about anyone. We're kind of just being observant or even saying positive things, but I'm kind of just trying to remove myself or lessen the amount that I'm talking about people, unless it's strictly something positive or saying something like redeeming about what was going on in that situation um, after I leave it. 
I've had this similar thing, but I, it was in the last few months, I've had a lot of people come up to me to bitch about other people and I've not joined in, but it was, I sat down with myself one day and I was a bit like, why are so many people feeling mm. comfortable to come to me to bitch? Because like, I must be giving out something yeah. that like, or I, that I, I, makes I often, it okay. I, I hear you. Like oftentimes I, I think about that because it's not like you are inviting it in. It's not like you do that yourself. But sometimes, I, <laughs> maybe this is wrong to think, but sometimes I feel like people kind of test the waters and see if you will engage. Yeah, for sure. To yeah. make you... 100%. Because they see yeah. you up here and they're like, wow, I can never imagine her talking poorly about someone. Mm. Let me see if she will. And it's not like a, you know, totally. like an intentional test, but I just think subconsciously people do that so that they feel validated in their feelings. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's like a good reminder to kind of like, maybe you're, you're going to help them learn in the moment that, you know, that doesn't need to be the focus, the negative or, you know. Yeah. Well, a new thing I've been doing is like, I've, when this come up, because I noticed it and I was like, okay, I need to do something about it. And now I've just started saying like, oh, come on, we're better than this. Let's not talk about this. Love like, that. Good one. It's kind of raising the values of everyone in the friendship yeah. group because like my friends aren't bitchy people. Yeah, so we're better why, than this. Why That's are we doing one. this? Like we are better than this. And also we should have more to talk about. And if our friendship only exists because we want to talk about other people, then the friendship shouldn't exist. Mm-hmm. Because like, we clearly have nothing better to talk about if we are talking about other people. Mm. Every time it's like a reflection of what that person is going through. Like yeah. m- in my experience so often, it's like just whoever's talking bad about the other person, it's a reflection of what that one person is going through and that other person is mirroring in them and they're recognizing that and they are uncomfortable with how that's making them feel so that they have to like talk about them. You know, it's almost like when girls are like, oh, she's like so cocky or she's like, it's like, oh, you're feeling insecure. You're jealous of someone that's feeling confident. So it's reflecting something in you that's making you feel like you need to say these things. And that's just so often the case. But I find too, and maybe this happens with you and I see it happen with Lindsay sometimes is if you're kind of in a situation where you're not even emoting much and you're just kind of blank, you know, you're just kind of hanging out. People will sometimes come to you and try and like talk shit because they see you just kind of like chilling. Mm-hmm. So it's almost like an open invitation to kind of, bring an emotion over and like discuss it you know i I also think it's the fastest way especially as women to bond oh yeah so (laughs) if it's someone new in a friendship group and like they come over and it's like if they start bitching about someone else that's their way of seeing an in in their friendship group but it's like even though it's the fastest way it's not the best way and it it's really damaging in the long run um and it's trying to recognize that. And I know it's it's quite strange because actually the how that pattern got broken for me was um, moving from school, which was very toxic environment and very like bitching about each other in order to bond to uni. Um, the girls in my friendship group in uni used to do this thing where like anytime you started bitching about someone, they'd be like, why are you doing that? Like, stop. Like, and it just, we called each other out on doing it all the time. And it just was very normal from day one to not do it. And I I hadn't actually realized how much I was doing it until someone started calling me out for it all the time. Only one person in the group is needed to do that. Like literally, if you're in a group, if you're one fucking person and you're like, hey, why are you doing that? Mm-hmm. It is yeah. contagious. Yeah, it shuts yeah. it down. Shuts it down. And then for the rest of your group, it's now... And on the body positivity thing, like when I've heard and seen people in my life like be body positive, I'll never forget it. And I'm like, Oh, like I rem- never remember being younger and I don't even know. It was a girl. It wasn't even about body positivity. It was about like being a normal human. It was a girl named Kristen. She was in college and she was dating a guy and like he caught her like pooping or something because they were like <laughs> rooming together. And I was like, oh my God, like, I can't believe that. I'm so sorry, blah, blah. And she's like, what? I'm a human. I'm going to poop. And I was like, holy, <laughs> like my, literally, I was like, <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, you, I was like, we are humans. Like he's a human and you're a human and we all fucking poop. I like will never be- remember, forget that. I'm like, yeah. that was so, it was so small, but the, like standing in it and being like, this is mm. whatever's going on to whoever. This is my body. This is what my body naturally does is like fucking powerful. 
I do that with um, periods quite a lot. So I, li- I was literally for lunch with my dad and I had a pap smear right before it. Um, and I couldn't, I didn't, well, it was silly, but I didn't realize you couldn't do a pap smear when you're in a period. And I literally just over lunch was like, oh, I didn't get to do my pap smear. But my dad was like, why? And I was like, oh, because I was on my period. And it's just so normal to me. And then I was kind of saying that afterwards. I was like, I bet most people wouldn't be able to say that to their dad without it being a like thing or a big conversation. I've done it with my guy friends to the point where I leaped on his chair when we were like, I didn't do it. On, I didn't do it on purpose. I did do it to have a conversation, but like, it is embarrassing. Like, or at least it was, and I was so embarrassed. And I noticed it right before I went to the loo, and I went and sat in the loo, and I was like, "What am I going to do? Do I tell him? Do I try to like subtly remove it, or like?" what do I do? And then I was like, come on, I'm like a body positive activist. And I'm wor- I'm sat in a loo worrying about this. And I was like, I just went out. And I was like, I went to the chair and pretended like I'd just seen it. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I just leaked in the chair. And he was just like, leaked. And I was like, oh my period, I like leaked. And he was like, oh, don't worry about it. And he literally went to get Aww. his... Um, <laughs> his scrubber from the like like for his to clean the dishes like that thing and I, no. I literally went oh no, no no I'm not sure you want to do that like and he was like what why and I was like because that's what you can use to clean the dishes and he was like so and he literally used the thing that he uses to oh clean my the dishes god I love and him scrubbed off the chair and then just like went back and I went and told all my followers this and I was like can you believe it like why Wait. did he not react to it but he like Use the, like I wouldn't even do that. I wouldn't use the thing that cleans my he's dishes. A, he's a winner. To, That's yeah. cute. Yeah. Well, I never, cute. I never thought about. I never thought about like period shaming, but we've yeah. all experienced it. Yeah, and I experienced it like early on. You know, when you're first dating people and you're you know having sex and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And I recently experienced it with someone. I was like, wait a second, mm. like we're adults. I don't Mm -hmm. understand this interaction right now. Like, Mm -hmm. why am I being shamed for having my period? Why is it disgusting to you? Why are you actually expressing that it's disgusting? If you Mm -hmm. feel that way, please don't share that with me. You know what I mean? It's like where we're from. Yeah. You know? But it it was that thing where when that happened with my friend, I was like, I, I was 24 at the time and I was a bit like, I'm 24 years old. Like, he was 26 years old. I was like, how are we not like that was an adult interaction around that was an adult interaction. Like, the same way you would spill red wine on someone's like thing. <laughs> yeah. Like it's the same. So cute. But, and it was treated <laughs> like it was that. But literally, I've never had more responses to an Instagram story before. Where wow. literally everyone was like, wow, this is so like unheard of. I wouldn't have even considered it. I would have just pretended. And like I, I was like, I really, I really wanted to pretend too. Like I could have go, gone back and sat down on that chair and pretended it was a knee and it was a dark enough like chair. It wasn't obvious. Mm. It was like blood. Um, but I was just like, no, like if I can't do this, then how, like, I, I can't that. be a body positive you. activist and be like, oh no, now I'm ashamed of my period. It's like a little challenge for you. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, on your Instagram, like when you have your interactions with your community and your followers and stuff, what I can imagine that you get a lot of DMs that are very heartfelt and that are very um, emotional, you know, related yeah. to body positivity and activism. What are some, like, what are the, what's the majority of the sentiments that you receive in your direct messages? They're just like, so I, this is cliche, but it's really human. Like, everyone, today I asked my followers for, a negative experience. I'm working on a new project. And I was like, what's a negative experience you've had multiple times in your life? And I'm reading through all these replies. Mm. And I was like, you do know there's a duplicate for every single response that I've got. You're not alone in this. Like there are literally like four people talking about breakups. There are four people talking about rape. There are four people like there was, there wasn't a single human experience that someone else wasn't going through exactly in that moment. And it's kind of that side of it I'm always shocked by how much people care about me and know about me so like if it's like I'll just get really nice messages like you seemed a bit off in your Instagram stories today are you okay I hope you're okay like it's just really really sweet sweet interactions oh I love that what has it been like you mentioned earlier dating Mm -hmm. and I know every human being when they Mm -hmm. are dating their insecurities come up yeah how how would you you know either talk to yourself or talk to others who are going through the same thing where, 
you know, you have another human being that could potentially judge you, but Mm -hmm. you're trying to be as open and confident as possible. Like what is, what have been your best practices while dating? I kind of do the thing that I mentioned with therapy and periods. I'm just quite casual with talking about hospital experiences. Like I was like, oh, this happened. I remember I was on a date. It was a first date. um, And, uh, he started talking about dogs and I was like, oh, I fell in love with dogs. I've always wanted a therapy dog that I'm going to take into hospitals when I'm older. And he was like, that's really specific. And I was like, yeah, well, when I was in hospital, like, and I just casually like mention it and it's not a big deal. And it's not something that like, I have to tell the whole story. I also think there is a thing that I now have where you earn the right to hear my story. It's quite a Brene Brown thing to say, but like, you don't get to know my whole life story on the first day. It's a lot harder for me because of the social side of it. And like, it's hard to get around describing my job without them finding everything out about me. But that's another side is that one of the biggest things I had around sex was that I always thought I had to give a disclaimer about my body before we got in the bedroom because because when I'm fully dressed, you can't see my scars. I thought it was deceptive to not say something beforehand. And I guess in like, if I was being honest with myself, I had that fear that I was going to take my top off and they would just like run from the room screaming, which I think actually more women than not have that fear, whether it's about scars or fat or whatever it is, stretch marks. I just, I did, I did it that way so many times. I like blurted out my hospital experiences on the way walking home and I texted my one of my exes. I texted this long paragraph about I have something really important to talk to you about because I felt like I it was like the third day I knew he was going to come stay over that evening and I was like I feel like he needs to know. But by doing that, I feel like it just made me a body, and I'm more than a body. And when you're getting into a relationship with me, you're not getting into a relationship with just my body. And that's like yes, it's part of the package. Yes, it probably will become a conversation. But how it becomes a conversation now is normally and naturally. And either it comes up because like we're talking about something which is hospital related and I'll just mention it. Or sometimes it'll be like on the sixth date, they'll finally ask me like, hey, so you know your scars, how do you get it? And like, it's been different with each person just because like every human experience is different, but it's not this forced thing. And it's not this thing I have to squeeze in before I take my top off anymore. Mm, I love that. In your um, TED talk on, I remember you talking about one of your friends like who had to get, it had to be dark and then she had to have her boyfriend leave the room and then she had to like get under the covers and in the morning she would get up and like put a full face of makeup on before her boyfriend would see her and that just like breaks my heart. No, like I, that, that. I think that was the part mm. in the TED talk where I started crying the most. No, it, you started to cry, <laughs> cry at a few points. It was like, I mean, I almost did too. I actually had to think about it. I had to make myself... I had to psych myself out to not cry during it because I was like, I don't know. I just like need to stop doing that, like crying when everyone else is crying. And that's like, if anyone cries, I start crying no matter what, if it's a genuine cry. So I was like, I actually had to have a moment and I like put a little bubble around myself. I was like, you can learn, but you don't need to cry. (laughs) (laughs) Like during (laughs) that talk. (laughs) Well, Um, my friends afterwards was like, in that moment, they thought I was going to, because I had two friends in the audience watching. And she said, in that moment, they thought they were going to lose it. They were going to rush on stage. And they were like, <laughs> they were like, we thought you, you you had it together. And then it was in the last like five minutes. You're like, oh no, she's going to lose it. It's just Aww. proof that like we, you know, when we do cry like that, when we feel, when we, when we are empathetic in that way, it's just like a reminder that we're all so connected, you know, and we're all experiencing so many things that are very similar, you know, like... And the reason why I was crying is because it's such a sad reality. Yeah, it's like, like prison. Yeah. It's like to still live in that. And the reality is most women are living in that. And even if they're not turn the lights off, have makeup on their face, they're still worrying about it. Whether they mm-hmm. do those things or not, they still would rather have the lights off. They would still rather have makeup on. Like, And it's not feeling lovable and not feeling good enough without any of those things. And I think it's genuinely so sad because what I've started to realize during this job, and this is really depressing reality, is that most people die having these insecurities. Like they don't escape from this. This is what they think being part of being a woman is, being part of being human. And it's so not. Like 
being insecure is not an accepted part of uh, of living. Like it doesn't have to be, and you can actually enjoy yourself in the bedroom. And prioritizing female pleasure in the bedroom is a huge thing because, like, it's again another vehicle where like we're told we should be selfless. And I don't know, especially that. I mean, I still I still know that woman and she still does the same thing and it still makes me sad to this day. Oh, yeah, it starts when kids are so young because I just think about like, I guess mine started in seventh and eighth grade and, you know, in high school. I don't remember really in college. I think in college it was probably the same, but maybe it was so used to it. But just li- like little girls, it's like, I feel like that's really the time when it really starts and it's just natural and normal for you to hate your body. And you kind of like sit in the bathroom with, or we'd have like volleyball practice and you'd like compare bodies and, you know, talk about what you didn't like. And, and that kind of thing just is like, so, you know, painful to think about. And so sad that it is the norm. What do you think could be done? I guess for little girls, like how could we, this is my last question, but how could we, um, how could we kind of change the conversation starting at a young age? I think it starts with parenting. Like it's a really cliched answer, but how like people, kids learn from their parents and when mothers hate themselves, I I use the example of the mother on the beach who's taking the photos of their kids, telling their kids they're beautiful and won't get in front of the camera herself. Like the kid isn't listening to you. Like the kid just sees the fact that especially if they're biological kid, you look like them and you're, you think you're ugly. But so even you can say you're beautiful till the cows come home, but they won't listen to it because they're like, I'm half of your DNA. I look like you and you hate yourself. As mothers, as fathers, as parents, even as like aunts or teachers or whatever it is, because as you said, one body positive person can make the difference. And I've, I've felt that as being the one body positive person in the friendship group, but also in a family, if your sister is really um, insecure, for example, you can be the body positive aunt. You can be the person to show them that like, actually they don't have to hate their body. And yes, okay, their mum might hate their body and their dad might hate their body and they might be really insecure, but you can be that one person to be that there for them as a child being like, you don't, this, you, there are other options. You don't have to hate yourself and you don't have to hate the way you look. Mm, love it. Can you share a little bit about what people can expect from I, uh, Am I Ugly? I'm really so Am this. I Ugly is my memoir um, and it starts at 11 years old, but it kind of goes backwards as well. But it tells the whole story of going through my surgeries, how I started to become insecure around my surgery scars, how I eventually stopped becoming insecure around them, um, how I find confidence and how I become a body confidence coach. Um, and it takes you through how, in hindsight, they're big milestones. In hindsight, it was that moment when I was 15 years old, but actually they're small steps along the way. And as much as I say it on my Instagram, I don't think anything captures it as well as my book, that body confidence is a long journey. And it took me a while to get where I am. And I just, I kept saying on my Instagram, and people weren't realizing it. And then people read my book and they're like, oh, now I get it. Like in hindsight, they're big milestones. But at the moment, it's one person saying one thing to me or that one friend having one conversation with me. And now like six years on or wherever it is, I can see the impact of those conversations. But at the time, you don't see it as a massive light bulb moment. It's only in hindsight. Mm-hmm. So exciting. And that is available now or is it still on pre-order? Yes, it, okay. It's out. Great. It's out. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah. So exciting. And people can connect with you where on social media? So I'm scared, not scared on most platforms or Michelle Elman on Facebook and YouTube. Beautiful. Yeah. Your Beautiful. YouTube channel is really amazing. Mm-hmm. Thank really you amazing. so much. I love it. Yes, I love it. Um, thank you so much for making the time for being an inspiration um, to Thanks people all over the world. On. And when we're in London, we'll have to find you. Yeah, we'll hear yeah, you. Definitely. <laughs> so we're coming um, next year. So if I'm ever in LA. Yeah, for yes, sure. Please, please do. Please. We would love that. And we can meet your friend who was not fe- afraid of the period. We would love to hang out with him too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he I, should start a movement. Yeah, honestly, you <laughs> should be like... <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think of the movement I'm names. Thinking of a hashtag. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bro, bros for periods. Okay. All right. Thanks so much, honey. We are so pumped to share with our audience and we will talk to you soon. Thanks, Thank Michelle. Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs>
Such a good one. Thank you so much, Michelle. It was a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Michelle for Prez. Yep. Michelle for Prez. Uh, So announcements right now, your podcast bro. Got a couple more weeks to sign up for the six-week course to help you ideate, launch, market, brand, build your podcast. Lindsay and I have been podcasting for over two years. We've built it into full-time jobs that we love that impact people all over the world. And we are so excited to take everything that we've learned, all the messy stuff we did for eight months or so, seven months or so in the beginning and really help you to launch your podcast. Mm -hmm. And what's so great is that there will be a community that you can lean on as well. It's nice to know that you're not alone doing this. And of course, we'll be there holding your hand, but there will also be other people starting podcasts that you can kind of lean on to maybe promote your show, cross promote, maybe have each other on, who knows. But I think that'll be a really important piece to the process. So again, yourpodcastpro.com. We're really excited to start working with you. The program starts January 6th. January 6th. And then there's also resources if if you need media kits, if you need Instagram templates, if you need, um, you know, to build a home studio, every all the studio stuff that we use is on there too. So there's tons of resources on yourpodcastpro.com. So mm-hmm. that's why you are podcastpro.com. Um, and then let's read the review of the week. Oh my god! Okay, um, five stars, and it's labeled 100. Mm -hmm. Everyone always says that Krista and Lindsay feel like they're best friends when you listen. So I don't want to say it again, but it's true. I have been listening to this podcast for a long time and it has inspired me so much with respect to healthy habits, products to use, and the fact that it is so entertaining to listen to. I am currently traveling solo for a month for my first time ever. And having this podcast has made me feel connected to home, but also totally inspired and confident. It has totally made this traveling experience a little bit better on the buses and planes and trains. I listen to this podcast driving to work at the gym, cleaning the house. I recommend this to everyone and even gifted one to my boyfriend to listen to. Highly mm. recommend. Thank you, Kristen and Lindsay from Toronto and can't wait for your next meetup. Mm, That's so sweet. That's from Mel from Toronto. I'm so proud of you for wow. doing that, for traveling around, being independent. By yourself. By yourself. I... I've done it. And that's incredible. And we're so, we love traveling with you. So thank you so much. Yeah. That means the world. Send us pics. Where yeah. are you? That's so awesome. Yeah. Honestly, you should be so <laughs> proud of yourself. It gets lonely, I know, but you, that's awesome. As always, thank you for your reviews. They mean so much to us. We read every one of them. We take them to heart. We do not take them lightly. So thank you. If you haven't rated and reviewed and you're pulled to do so, we would love your review. The reviews really help us to um, get more visibility and Mm -hmm. reach more people. Mm -hmm. So, all right, y'all. Thanks so much. See you you later. Bye.